Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. Uh, so we're wrapping up April here. This will be our last demo meeting for April 2020. Hope folks are doing well, being safe. We've got some good stuff to cover today, so let's hop on in. New modules. We have a lot of new modules this time around, uh, and particularly a lot around achieving code execution. Like every module on this particular slide here uh, is all about code execution. Community contributor Honor E or ER provided a module targeting vulnerable versions of Pandora flexible monitoring system, an open source network monitoring solution. Versions 7.0 NG and prior allow authenticated code execution via unsanitized input being passed to the system function in nettools.php. Good times. Community contributor to HID Shake added a new module for Play SMS, which is an open source SMS management solution. This module targets versions which contain a vulnerability in index PHP that can allow code to be injected into the template engine, allowing for unauthenticated remote code execution Good stuff. Our own Spencer McIntyre added a new module for CVE 2020-0796, AKA SMB v3 compression buffer overflow AKA SMB Ghost. Using this module against vulnerable Windows 10 targets running compression enabled SMB version three will allow users to leverage an existing session to both escalate privilege and execute a payload as the system user on a vulnerable target. Super cool. Our own William Vu added a module targeting Nexus repository manager, exploiting a Java expression language or EL injection in Nexus versions up to and including 3.21.1 to execute code as the Nexus user. And we'll have a demo of this one. Community contributor Mehmet Ints provided a new module for vulnerable versions of Vesta control panel, an open source hosting control panel. This module helps an authenticated user take advantage of a command injection vulnerability within the vlist user backups script and gain code execution as the root user on the target. Neat. And we'll have a demo of this as well. Community contributors Pedro Ribirio and Radek Domanski added a new module for targeting specific model and specific firmware of a TP-Link Archer A7C7 router, allowing an attacker on the LAN side to exploit a command injection vulnerability in the TDP server daemon to gain unauthenticated remote code execution. Pretty neat. Our own Will Vu added a module targeting LifeRay Portal, an open source enterprise portal solution, which exploits a Java unmarshalling vulnerability via JSON web services to gain unauthenticated code execution as the LifeRay user on vulnerable targets. And we'll have a demo of this one. And Wilvu also added a new module for targeting vulnerable versions of ThinkPHP, where the module itself contains multiple PHP injection vectors and chooses the appropriate one at runtime. And we'll have a demo of this one as well. well good demos. And some more modules uh, not related to code execution. <laughs> Contributor Hoodie added a new directory traversal auxiliary module for Lime Survey, an open source survey tool. This module supports two attack vectors, one via the git zip file function, which allows the download of arbitrary files due to insufficient sanitization of the path parameter, and the other via download zip function, which enables arbitrary file downloads via the unsanitized szip parameter. And another directory traversal module, this one from Diraj Mishra, targeting Zen load balancer, allowing download of files using the file log parameter in a git request to index.cgi. Community contributor Bartik added a new mo post module for executing .NET assemblies in memory using interpreter sessions. This provides a lot of options for using tools external to the Metasploit, such as Ghostpack Seatbelt in the context of post exploitation. And we'll have a demo of this one. Contributor Hoodie came through with a nice lift on the Ubiquity Unify code and framework, adding a new mix-in and also a new module for ingesting the Ubiquity config file itself into framework, accepting both UNF and DB formats. Hoodie also added support for Unify Dream Machine Pro 2. Super cool. And rounding out our module list today, Community Contributor Hanger added a new post module for fans of Bloodhound out there. Utilizing an existing session on a Windows target, this new module will reflectively load and execute Sharkhound 
to gather information on sessions, local admin, domain trusts, etc., which is ultimately stored as a Bloodhound consumable zip file in framework loop. You can then load that zip into Bloodhound and voila, visualized Active Directory environment. Who doesn't like that? And as usual, we have a lot of other valuable work going on to talk about. Community contributor Slidog updated the Windows Interpreter steal token logic to reduce permissions down to the minimum required. Appreciate that. Contributor Tim Wright implemented proper file system wildcard handling in the Java Interpreter. That's good. Contributor Hoodie updated the Windows Trusted Service Path module and renamed it Unquoted Service Path to work better with modern Windows targets. Uh, and we'll have a demo of this one. Hoodie also added additional checks to the MSF Tidy uh, Docs documentation linter. Good stuff. Our own Alan Foster added the label actions GitHub app to automatically add an informative comment to any PR where the needs docs label has been applied. Uh, this helps to better inform contributors what is needed without requiring additional context uh, from the committer team. And our own Brent Cook updated some error messages to be warning level messages when the console starts up. I think David Gahan would approve of that one. And a handful of bug fixes, uh, including interpreter. A community contributor OJ fixed a crash in the stageless Windows interpreter when the config block is located in non writable memory. Good fix there. And contributor Tim Wright fixed a crash in the Android interpreter related to applying the wake lock. Appreciate that. And our own Alan Foster fixed a few ubiquity RSpec tests so that they now pass correctly, which is always a good thing. And a bonus slide. All right, we've been talking about uh, attacker knowledge base. Uh, we've got some really exciting news this week. The beta has now switched from me, a closed beta to an open beta, uh, which is super exciting. Uh, as of this past Wednesday, uh, the, we, we brought it, the team brought it live online uh, to the public. And if you're interested in participating in the open beta, just go to attackerkb.com. The site is publicly readable without logging in and you just need a valid GitHub login to contribute assessments, leave comments, or upvote or downvote assessments and comments. It's really cool. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts at blog.rapid7.com. And we do appreciate all of y'all who help make Metasploit better through your contributions to the project. Thank you. And with that, let's get on to some demos. People love demos. Execute.NET assembly. Well, Mr. Waters, are you, are you with us? Absolutely, sir. So this, uh, this module, uh, unfortunately, I was a little bit confused by it at first. It was originally called Execute Assembly. I thought it was kind of like Execute Shellcode. Um, it is not. What this does is this allows us to take uh, .NET EXE and upload it into memory, into the remote machine, and run it without putting it to disk, which is really awesome to be able to do given the popularity of things like C-sharp and other .NET tool sets. In this case, you can see uh, I've selected uh, Seatbelt, uh, which is a, a credential grabbing tool uh, written in .NET, the .NET framework. Um, I've gone ahead and pulled it down, compiled it locally on my machine, and I'm going to pass that in. The argument that I'm passing it is user because I want to uh, grab the user credentials. I go through, notice it says the .NET versions that are installed on the target here, uh, which is really awesome because you never know exactly what situation you're gonna get into when it comes to .NET. Um, and it's not really easy to get that information back. As you can see, we went ahead and we pushed it up into memory. Uh, basically this spawns a notepad process, then, put, then, then puts the uh, CLR host into memory in the notepad process and feeds the .NET executable in. Uh, so it's an absolutely awesome tool we've got. We've got some uh, improvements coming for it in the PRQ right now. I'm looking forward to landing those. Thank you, Brendan. That's a, nice to You're have very welcome. It. Looks super cool. All right. And I've got a demo of the Vesta control panel remote code execution. Mr. Wilcox, you on the line? Hello. Yeah, so this was CV 2021-0808. It's a RCE as an authenticated user. Um, now, in this demo, we have sped things up a little bit. Normally, this module takes about five minutes to execute due to just some specifics of the exploit. Um, 
so what we can see here is basically I'm just looking over the options. Um, it does leave some indicators of compromise in the logs and in some config changes that are necessary for the exploit. However, we have gone ahead and um, a later PR did actually update this a little bit more to um, remove some of the artifacts and configs in the log. Um, this will prevent any backdoors from forming as part of the test. So if we just go ahead and we're just setting up the username and password and a few other options for this to run successfully. One thing that should be noted about this exploit is that currently there is no patch for this. Um, there has been a patch pushed to the upstream on the GitHub. However, this has not been released to customers yet. So presently anyone who's running Vesta CP will be affected by this vulnerability. Good to know. And yeah, so the, the exploit can have a tendency to uh, fail on the first attempt. So this is what you're seeing here is basically it will, it failed on the first attempt, but the second attempt did actually manage to get the um, shell successfully. And you can see that we're executing as the root user. Nice. Um, one of the other things that we've highlighted here is just demonstration that we are in fact deleting the files this way that if they're not deleted for whatever reason, the user can go back and delete those files as needed to clean up after the exploit runs. And we can see that the files have been removed successfully as part of that test. And we're just gonna go ahead and check that the log files also been deleted successfully. And we can see there's no uh, backup.log file there. So, um, sorry, backup.config file. So that has also been cleaned successfully. I got another one from Grant here, the library portals remote code execution. Start yeah, one so up. this one is a unmarshalling RC and library portal versions prior to 6.2.5 GA6. 7.0.6 GA7, 7.1.3 GA4, and 7.2.1 GA2. Um, it was, uh, this module also results in remote execution as the library used it. During testing, we found it to be incredibly reliable. We can um, exploit the same targets multiple times, have multiple sessions open at the same time. Um, so it's very reliable and stable. The vulnerability itself is in the JSON web service action parameters map of library portal, and it allows the instantiation of arbitrary classes and invocation of arbitrary set of commands. In this example, we can see that we're testing against uh, the local host. The reason for this is that during testing, we had a Docker image, which had the software pre-installed, as you can see here. It's running on my local host on port 8080. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and exploit that so long, as you can see in the demo here. And once exploitation occurs, we get a shell as the library user. Last one from Grant, and then we got a few more. So uh, this is the Nexus repository manager. Yeah, so this is a vulnerability in Nexus Repository Manager prior to 3.21.1, actually, sorry, including 3.21.1. Um, and this is a RCE, um, which results in arbitrary execution as the Nexus user. As you can see here, we're just checking the pre-configured 
sorry, the user that I set up, which is a test user, it's just got anonymous access. It doesn't have access to the admin. So this is the lowest privilege user that you can create by default on the system. Um, so the, the Java enterprise language vulnerability is in the service REST beta repository scope group pages data parameter. And um, this will essentially allow remote execution as the Nexus user. So we're just going to go ahead and set up the options here. Um, during testing, we had a, another local Docker image. So you'll see us setting the remote target to just the local Docker image that we had run. It should be noted that this is an authenticated exploit, but any user can be used. So let's see, after a little bit of time, we should get uh, a shell. I'll just check the ID. Open up the shell to double check it. And we can see we're running as the Nexus user. Neat. Really nice. Yeah, thank you for those demos, Grant. That's great. Will Vu and Grant, what a pair. And we got a couple demos from uh, Spencer. I think Spencer you online. Yes, I am. Cool. Uh, let's see, this is the trusted service path, unquoted service path. Yeah, so this is uh, technically not a brand new module, uh, but our con uh, community contributor Hoodie uh, made quite a few improvements to it. Um, it's now capable of leveraging scenarios where the uh, trust the path that the attacker can write to is anywhere along the path as opposed to only the root of the drive. And it can also optionally leave the executable payload on disk, which will allow it to the, the module to be leveraged in environments where the service that is being targeted uh, automatically restarts on reboot with the attacker can't uh, restart it themselves manually. So it makes it much, much more flexible as well as it renames it uh, to be able to be identified more easily based on more recent references to this particular class of vulnerabilities. This doesn't exactly leverage um, a traditional CVE like some of the previous modules that we have been looking at does. Uh, but rather a common misconfiguration. Um, so that makes this module uh, have, it's gonna have a long shelf life and hopefully be usable in uh, quite a few environments. And so what we can see right here, if we ran the check, we found that uh, the target was vulnerable and it waited in between. Um, if you caught that, uh, the remote system rebooted and when it came back up online, or that's actually what we're looking at right now, when it comes back online, we're gonna uh, wait just a second here, and we're going to have a system session uh, open. And so we saw that we were running as a normal user, that we couldn't get elevated, but we did have the permissions to reboot it. So it's kind of up to the user on whether or not they want to wait for that to happen naturally, or if they want to force the reboot to happen on demand. But that's it. Super cool. And uh, another demo from Spencer on the Think PHP remote code execution. That's right. It's kind of like a, a two in one sort of thing, I think. Here. Um, our own William Vu added uh, this module to leverage uh, two different uh, CVEs in the same product, uh, which is the Think PHP platform. Uh, what's really nice about this module, and we'll catch it as we run it, is that it is actually going to fingerprint the remote version and then select the vulnerability to leverage based on that. Um, so if the, the remote system is vulnerable or running either one of the uh, vulnerable versions, it has its fingerprint here and it's going to uh, craft its request to leverage the appropriate vulnerability that can target that session or that system. Uh, in order to allow us to open up a um, interpreter session. 
And uh, as you can see right there, it runs within the context of the user that's running the, the web software. So not, not quite root, but it is uh, remote code execution without authentication. Nice. All right, uh, so this, uh, this module leverages uh, the SMB ghost vulnerability, which is an out of bound write in the SMB 3.1.1, which is the latest revision of the SMB 3 protocol uh, to leverage a vulnerability within the how compression frames are handled. Uh, now this LPE of uh, my testing is very reliable. Um, and we included a check method which uh, leverages its position as a local exploit to check the registry for what Microsoft was uh, recommending as the interim patch to remove uh, SMB3 compression capabilities. Um, after that, it's going to go ahead and it's going to load a reflective DLL into the process where it is going to leak an address of a critical structure to overwrite. Um, before it's going to corrupt that in order to escalate its privileges before finally injecting the payload uh, that we're setting right now into a process which runs as system that is going to allow us to uh, escalate our privileges from the user onto uh, on this system that is affected. Did anybody have any questions on uh, that vulnerability? Ooh, I do, I do. This is Brent. Hello. Hey, Brent. Hi. Um, I know that there have been a couple of um, POCs um, claimed on Twitter, and I think there was a really great blog post yesterday about um, how to get an info leak remotely with SMB Ghost. Um, would this module potentially be modifiable if it like had access to that remote memory leak to, to basically do the same kind of technique? Uh, potentially, yes. We, uh, Grant and I were looking at the blog post that I believe you're referring to, and it looked like they were uh, leveraging the memory descriptor list, the MDL mm -hmm. structures, through uh, what we thought was the RDMA capability of the SMB3 protocol in order to leverage out and uh, leak that information. Um, we needed to confirm that it was actually using RDMA and that we'd be able to do that remotely, but it's possible that we may be able to adapt the technique to be done um, oh. as an RCE as opposed to an LPE. Oh, very interesting. Um, yeah, I saw that there was also a, a, a POC from ZecOps, but they just showed like a, I guess a, a video of it in action and not as much technical detail, but um, all right, cool. Um, sounds neat. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the demo, Spencer and Brendan. Appreciate that. All right, Attacker KB or the Attacker Knowledge Base. There's a really good blog post called Meet Attacker KB that Caitlin Condon wrote up on the blog that rapid7.com website. It's a, a great read. You should go check it out. It gives a good overview of what it is. Um, and the team has some, some demos today, uh, kind of show you what's been going on and what's in the works. Uh, we'll start out with maybe the ability to watch a topic with James. This is a, a feature that we got out just before we made Attacker KB live. Um, Basically, it was, it was a heavily requested feature from a lot of people during the closed beta that um, we have the ability to send out notifications on when activity happens on a topic, uh, but we those notifications would only get enabled if you actually had interacted with the topic in some way. So um, if you had created an assessment, then you would get notifications when, like, somebody replied to the assessment or that the topic was updated. But if you, you know, didn't have any... Um, if you didn't want to contribute an assessment, there was no way to still get notified on activity for uh, any, a given topic. So this feature allows you to click this little, this new little notification icon up here um, that's filled in. So now as this user, Juggernaut, I'm watching the topic. Um, so now anytime activity uh, occurs on the topic, I should receive a notification for it. So um, I'm going to come over here and just uh, assess this topic as J Barnett. Um, this is uh, vulnerable in the default configuration, very difficult to patch. It's already weaponized and it's unauthenticated too. So, um,
I create my assessment, um, click submit here, and now J Juggernaut should receive notification that um, there's a new assessment created. So let's just verify. Yep, so I got a new email here. J Barnett created an assessment. Um, you can click through to view the assessment, but I'm already logged in, so I'm not gonna click through. Um, it's So any, all of the notifications you receive are based on your, um, your settings here in the uh, in your profile page. Um, so if you have topic updated, uh, replies to your assessment. I know it says like your assessment or things you've done, but the same settings apply. We just need to update the wording here. Um, like so, if I go through and I've, I update this uh, topic to let's say it's a uh, remote and it's RCE and uh, exploitable always, reliable always, stability always. So now I should get a notification that uh, this topic was updated as well. It takes a second, yeah. So the topic was updated and um, yeah, so now I can click through and, and view that notification. So yeah, you also get in-app notifications too based on your settings. So that's it, it's, uh, it's a really nice way to be able to see, get, you know, say there's something you're interested in um, that you wanna follow, but uh, don't necessarily want to contribute something yourself. This is uh, the way to do it. So hopefully, um, you know, people can get some use out of it. And that's available right now up on production. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's live. It went live with Attacker KB on Wednesday. Cool. Awesome. All right. And uh, we get a demo of the user search from Matthew. All right. So maybe you're using the system and you, you know uh, part of a user's name and you wanna look them up. Maybe you wanna pull up their profile and take a look at some posts you saw recently, but you don't remember which, which of these topics you saw it in. So let's say I'm, I'm looking for Brent and I know it's Buster something, but I just, I just know Buster. So I'm gonna run a quick search for Buster. And over here, you'll notice the, the search page looks a little bit different. There's now a, a little filter off to the left-hand side where we see the primary in the search of topics, which is what we used to do. And now there's uh, users. You see if there's one result here. So I'm gonna click over here since I was looking for a user. And that's it, I found Buster B. That's the user I was looking for. And now I can navigate to that user's profile and possibly find uh, the comment or assessment I had seen previously and was searching for such as a really quick view of the search, but basically allows you to search for a partial or full username and then see the results of those users and then navigate to their individual profiles. So hopefully we can continue exploring the data behind Attacker KB in different ways. That's super useful. I love it. Yeah, and then it's also up on production, right, Matthew? Yep, this is actually, this was demoed live off our site. Attackergaby.com. Yeah, there it is. We'll round things out uh, with some email styling from our own Sonny. So James kind of showed you uh, how some of the notifications work. Um, we've got the in-app as well as uh, email notifications. And so right before we launched, we updated the emails kind of from a just a texty kind of version to a styling that reflects the attacker KB. Um, UX. And so I just wanted to kind of note a few things um, about the emails in general. And I think James sort of uh, showed you when particular events happen. Uh, for example, this particular CVE, um, I've got uh, two users. Um, one is myself, and then I've got a development um, sort of version of it. So let me take you quickly through kind of the workflow. So I'm gonna use uh, Aaron's handy dandy revision history to show that uh, S. Gonzalez R7 submitted an assessment on this particular uh, topic. Um, and then SG Dev uh, went and made a comment on it and says, okay, I agree. So that's one of the events that will trigger uh, an email. So you can see here after SG replied to that assessment, uh, S. Gonzalez R7 gets an email that says, hey, this particular user applied, replied to your assessment. And so some of the things we added um, were being able to click on a particular user 
uh, so that you could, for example, get to their profile easily and say, oh, who's this person who's commenting on my stuff? Um, another thing you can do is go to the topic directly. Um, but more interestingly, we had this feature before, we just added a nice button, and that's going to the reply directly. So when a user is getting these email notifications, uh, we've got these links to be able to give them a little bit more context um, into, you know, exactly uh, what happened. So now that um, SG has made that comment, um, S. Gonzalez R7 comes back and says, oh, I, I want to update my assessment. Um, you know, so he adds a, a little bit more text to it, in which case now, because SG Dev was watching that particular, um, S, or made a, a comment on that assessment, they are automatically uh, now receiving the notifications um, for it. They participated. So now SG Dev is informed that somebody's updated, Eskins also updated their assessments. So as they're trying to keep up with this particular topic and assessments, folks are kind of getting these emails um, and it has kind of a nice styling um, around it. Now, I want to just note two more or show two more things that were kind of part of the, the email styling was also uh, the text, the copy. Um, these are kind of proofs that I have open of how we check that our emails have the right language, but uh, we paid particular attention to the grammar. So for example, uh, we've got a user cow uh, who replied to your assessment. So the person, the recipient of the email, um, if someone replied to their assessment, they'll get that language, you know, your assessment. There's another case. Um, if you're a third party watcher, you'll get an email notification that talked about Cal, you know, replied to a conversation about someone else's assessment um, of a particular topic. And then uh, if Cal is the one who wrote the uh, assessment, uh, then we'll insert the language there. So Cal replied to a conversation about their assessment. So a per, one particular event will trigger uh, several emails depending on the viewpoint of the recipient. Um, so that we've added kind of that personalization to engage users to be able to say, oh, um, I'm interested in this thing and oh, who's this person who commented or I know that person. Um, like Buster B, he's pretty uh, popular or, you know, in the know, I'm going to go check out that, that notification. And the last thing I kind of wanted to show, uh, here we go, is we've had just a little bit of mobile friendliness. So here is uh, that particular email I showed earlier um, when Eskins All-Star 7 updated their assessment. SG Dev received an email and uh, he checks it on his mobile email client. And we've just done a few uh, things like make the Attacker KB logo stretch across uh, as opposed to uh, only covering, you know, a, about a fourth of the, the top. And then for mobile friendliness, typically the rule of thumb is to make uh, buttons a lot bigger so that when you're touching the screen, uh, you won't uh, miss the, the button itself. So they're just minor things, but hopefully are uh, make it more attractive, number one, and number two, make it more usable for uh, mobile. So that is the kind of overview of uh, the email notification styling and some of the personalization we added for the language um, and adding a little bit, you know, a few more links to provide context. Any, uh, any questions? No, it looks really good, Sonny. Okay, cool. Is this is this uh, have these changes also been deployed to production? Oh yes, they were uh, deployed to production um, at the at the time of launch. They were all part of it. Fantastic. Hey everybody, Pierce of the Rapid Seven here. Just wanted to tell you about Attacker KV, the Attacker Knowledge Base, which is a new resource designed to highlight diverse perspectives on which vulnerabilities make the most appealing targets for attackers and why. We just went into open beta recently with this. It's really easy to get to. You just go to your web browser of choice, type in attackerkb.com. It'll take you straight to the main landing page. 
you don't have to log in with GitHub, but if you do, it'll allow you to interact more with the site. So just log down there and click a topic to learn more about this particular vulnerability. All the factual data is at the top, and then we have assessments down below. You can click Add Assessment to leave your own assessment on a particular topic. Uh, here's one that another user left. Lots of good information about their feelings of the attacker value and exploitability. I gave it an upvote there because uh, I like the, the amount of data that they left here. You can you know, expand out and read the full assessment they left. Uh, another user already left a reply here with a little bit of additional information. Uh, here's me just adding a, you know, the, the, my two cents of thoughts on what I, you know, how I might feel about this particular vulnerability and this assessment of it. And click Submit. And easy peasy, and that's part of the site data there. And I'll transition over and show you the leaderboard, which is just a way to show which users are kind of the heavy hitter contributors with assessments and comments on the site. As you can see, I'm number 37, AME. And if you go to the upper right and click the profile page, you'll be taken to a kind of a one-stop shop, see all the contributions you've made to Attacker KB, assessments and comments all in one place. It's very convenient. There's a settings tab here that lets you go in and tweak your email and in-app notifications as you like them. There's also an API that you can interface with Tiger KB. Uh, you can generate your API key here by clicking that button. Clicking the link below will take you to Swagger Docs. It shows you all the endpoints you can use to pull topic and assessment type data from Attacker KB. And that is Attacker KB in a nutshell. Come by to attackerkb.com and visit us sometime. We'd love to have you. Excellent.